This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. GIF Have we mentioned before that there are some really weird beasts in the role-playing games we love? Well, there are. We've mentioned the weirdness of the stump bunny beast, known only as a wolf in sheep's clothing, and discussed the strange fungoid myconids. Those creatures have a sort of obvious outright weirdness to them. A sort of what-the-heck kind of weirdness. But sometimes the weirdness is different. It's a double-take sort of weirdness, an incongruousness, a sort of... huh? For example, if you went flipping through the pages of a certain monster supplement released in 1989, you might first just flip right past the strange hippopotamus monster before your brain registered what it saw. It wasn't really a hippo at all. It had the head of a hippo, but it was humanoid. You'd flip back. Yep, it's a hippo man. With a monocle. Dressed in a uniform reminiscent of a Napoleonic officer and bedecked with medals. And it was wielding some sort of flintlock pistol. Honestly, if not for the hippo head, you'd expect to have a name like the Right Honorable Admiral Fullingston Heath of Her Majesty's Royal Navy. Retired. That thing was called a GIF. Well, to be fair, you probably wouldn't be taken too much aback. To even get to the GIF, you'd have to get past a whole pile of weird beasts, like a grinning, toothy asteroid monster, a blob of goo covered in eyes and mouths wielding a really complicated halberd-like polearm, several varieties of robot spiders, and a sentient being composed of three blobs of gelatin that warp themselves into lenses to focus the rays of the sun into death rays. Of course, you'd be looking at the monsters of Spelljammer. Spelljammer is one of those settings for D&D that everyone remembers, but no one except a very small, very dedicated cult fan base remembers actually playing. It could be described as Dungeons and Dragons in space, but that would be selling it short by a long shot. It had a very unique, very distinct style that just couldn't be encapsulated in a one-sentence elevator pitch like that. Spelljammer was officially born in a bar. No surprise there. It was the brainchild of Jeff Grubb. You remember him, right? The guy who organized the entire D&D cosmos? Well, Grubb got started with D&D when he was a freshman in high school. He'd been a fan of Avalon Hill's brand of war games for a while and started attending his high school gaming club. There, he encountered a group of other gamers in a corner playing something unlike anything Jeff Grubb had ever seen. He asked what it was. In response, supposedly, one of the players handed him a set of dice and said, Here, start rolling. You can be our cleric. In short order, Grubb was hooked. He invented his own fictional world and started running games at conventions. His world was called Toral and included a number of analogs of ancient civilizations, including Asian, Mesoamerican, and Oriental empires. And Grubb liked to claim that the world Toral was an ancient word that meant cradle of life. Interestingly, Grubb's world was eventually merged with Ed Greenwood's Forgotten Realms campaign, with Faerun becoming another continent alongside Mastica, Karator, and Zakara, and the planet became known as Eber Toral. Eventually, Grubb got noticed, and he was tasked with running official events for TSR, the publishers of D&D at the time. And that led to him getting a full-time job at TSR as a game designer. Grubb went on to design D&D products, to design products for other game systems, to write novels and comics, and to work on video games. But back in 1989, he was in a bar called Augie's with the rest of the TSR design team. They were trying to brainstorm ideas for products for the upcoming year. And Grubb wanted to do something different. He wanted to push the bounds of fantasy and to bring science fiction elements into it. And so he pitched the idea of Spelljammer. And it, along with the new Dragonlance product, became one of the two major TSR releases in 1989. Interestingly, Grubb almost didn't get to write the product he was so excited about. The two products were to be divided between Jeff Grubb and David Cook, but Cook didn't have much experience with the Dragonlance world and Grubb did. So it looked like Cook was going to end up writing Spelljammer, until Grubb convinced him that the new product was only loosely connected to the core stories of the Dragonlance world 
and that anyone could write it. Now, Spelljammer, whose name is incidentally derived from the name of a class of massive 19th and 20th century merchant ships called Windjammers, was neat. It was weird, but it was neat. In Spelljammer, the heroes and villains would sail magical sailing ships between the planets and stars. The ships themselves were based on sailing vessel designs, but were carved to resemble various sea creatures, insects, and other fantastic beasts. Different races had different design aesthetics. The ships themselves were powered by a special magical item called a Spelljammer Helm, which was basically a magical throne that allowed a spellcaster to sense and control the ship as an extension of his own body and spirit. But apart from the wacky designs and the strange creatures, Spelljammer had a lot of science behind it, both the modern kind of science that still basically holds true today, and the ancient science that is part knowledge, part conjecture, and part mythology. Basically, if you played Spelljammer, you quickly became well-versed in the Ptolemaic model of the universe, Stahl and Bescher's theory of combustion, and even a little bit of Johann Kepler's laws of planetary harmonics. The story of the science of Spelljammer begins in ancient Greece. Now, the Greeks were very impressive when it came to observational astronomy. Of course, they weren't the only ones. The Egyptians had developed very accurate calendars based on the heavens, and the Babylonians were great observers of the night sky. But the Egyptians were driven by the need to determine precise dates so they could prepare for the periodic flooding of the Nile River. And the Babylonians believed the future was written in omens in the sky. For the Greeks, Astronomy was the pursuit of pure science. They wanted to understand their universe, and so they dug pretty deep. Early on, for example, the Greek philosopher Pythagoras figured out that the Earth was round by paying careful attention to eclipses. See, the Greeks had figured out that the moon didn't give off any light of its own. It was lit up by the sun. As the relative positions of the Earth, the sun, and the moon changed, so too did the portion of the moon we could see illuminated by sunlight. That's why the moon went through regular phases. But sometimes, the Earth would completely block the light from the sun, and that would cause a lunar eclipse. Pythagoras realized that the shadow of the Earth on the moon during an eclipse was circular, and that meant the Earth was circular. Later, as the Greeks explored the rest of the world, they noticed that the sun cast shadows in different directions in different parts of the world, and that the elevations of the stars would change as you sailed around. And that further cemented the idea that the Earth was a sphere, not flat. The Greeks even used this information to roughly estimate the size of the Earth, and to hypothesize the existence of Australia. But none of that is what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is crystal spheres. See, in Spelljammer, each individual D&D world is locked away inside its own chunk of space and surrounded by an indestructible cosmic sphere. And that's where Claudius Ptolemaeus enters our story. Known to his friends in a millennia of fans as Ptolemy, in the 2nd century AD, Ptolemy developed a model of the universe that would be taken as correct by European and Islamic astronomers for a thousand years. And it came down to resolving a problem. See, the Greeks knew that the Earth was at the center of the cosmos. Now sure, we know they were wrong about that one now, but they knew it. And that was based on the assumption that the stars surrounded the Earth in roughly equal proportions and would rise and set. Assuming all of the stars were equidistant from the Earth, that meant that the Earth was surrounded by a sphere of stars. So it had to be at the center. The sun and moon went around the Earth, and that made the Greeks happy because they loved circles. If something was a circle, it was probably right. But they noticed that there were some weird, ill-behaved stars. These stars, which they named planetos, or wanderers, didn't move like all of the other stars. While all the other stars moved uniformly, all together, the planets moved on their own. They crossed the sky like the sun and moon. And so the Greeks assumed they were other objects, not the sun, not the moon, not stars. And they too were going around the Earth. After all, the Earth was at the center. So everything would have to be going around the Earth. But every so often, one of these wanderer stars would do something weird. It would start moving backwards for a while, and then, eventually, it would start moving forward again. This motion is called retrograde motion. That simply means moving in the other direction. But the Greeks were baffled. Today, we understand retrograde motion. It comes from the fact that the sun is at the center, and the Earth and all of the planets are going around it, 
And that means as we all orbit the sun in our celestial dance, sometimes we get ahead of other planets that move slower than us. So they appear to be going backwards until we get around the sun and start going back the other way. But to the Greeks, this was a weird problem. And Ptolemy came up with a solution. He proposed that the sun, moon, planets, and stars were all mounted on great nested spheres that surrounded the earth. But the planets were also mounted on small spheres on those spheres and were going round and round in their own little cycles. As the larger sphere turned, that carried the planet through the sky. And the planet's own little sphere turned, and that made the planet sometimes change direction. And he worked out all of the math and developed a beautiful system that predicted the motions of all the known planets. The only drawback was that it was completely wrong. But the Ptolemaic model endured for thousands of years. It wasn't until another astronomer came along named Nicholas Copernicus that things changed. He came along and did some more different math and realized that all of the motions of the planets could be explained more simply and more accurately if you just assumed everything was going around the sun. Retrograde motion was just an illusion created by the fact that the Earth was also in motion. And thus began the Copernican revolution in astronomy. But before we discuss how Spelljammer deals with that, it's important to talk about what's outside the crystalline spheres. In the Spelljammer universe, it's possible to leave the crystal spheres by creating magical temporary passages through them. And that's the only way to travel to other worlds. Now, inside the crystal spheres are planets and a sun and moons and all the stuff we expect in space. Outside the sphere, things are wild. There, wild streams of rainbow-colored fog flow between the crystal spheres and a vast network of rivers. Once you get your magical spaceship outside the crystal sphere, you can sail along these currents and travel between all of your favorite D&D worlds. And even go find Earth. It was out there. But what's particularly interesting about these river clouds is that they were luminous and highly flammable, even explosive. And they were called the phlogiston. Why is that interesting? Because it also shows off Grubb's great understanding of the history of science. See, for ages, scientists were confused about fire. The Greeks had assumed fire was an element, a material of the universe. So when wood caught fire, what was really happening was the wood was being converted back into its constituents of fire and ash. But people had started to notice some oddities about this idea. Most notably that if you weighed the ash after the wood finished burning, it weighed the same as a piece of wood. Nowadays we know there is actually a very small change in the weight, but scientists then were baffled. Eventually a scientist named Johann Joachim Bashir rejected the theory of elements. Instead, he started classing substances as three different types of matter, combustible matter, hard matter, and fluid matter. In 1667, he published a book named Physica Subterranea, The Science Under the Ground. In 1703, doctor and chemist Georg Ernst Stahl refined this theory and posited that there was a weird substance called phlogiston, from a Greek word for combustion, that flammable materials contained. When a material was burned, it would release its phlogiston into the air, and this explained how there seemed to be two different kinds of air and how certain types of air could put out a fire. Air that was rich in phlogiston couldn't take any more. It was saturated. Today we call that carbon dioxide. And air that was hungry for phlogiston would swallow it up. Today we call that oxygen. Stahl also used this to explain rusting. Rust was metal depleted of its phlogiston. And again, we now know that oxygen causes metal to rust. We call that oxidation. But now, let's talk about what's inside the crystal spheres in Spelljammer, and one of the features in Spelljammer that we here at the Word of the Week thought was just the coolest thing of all. Inside each crystal sphere, there was a sun, a star. It was in the middle, and it had a system of planets orbiting around it. Abertoral and Crin and Oerth were planets in solar systems just like ours. But that's not the cool part. The cool part was that Spelljammer included a system for randomly creating entire star systems. It would tell you how many planets there were, how far they were from their respective stars, 
and what types of planets they were. You could have swirling balls of gas like Jupiter, balls of rock and iron and water like Earth, and even small rocky lumps of nothing like Mercury. And you got a big old poster map with a whole bunch of concentric circles on it and a bunch of tokens you could cut out to track the movement of all of your different planets. And the neatest thing of all was that it was all inspired by a scientific reality. Getting back to our astronomical story, Nicholas Copernicus trashed the Ptolemaic model by demonstrating that everything went around the sun. We call that the heliocentric model. Helios is the Greek name for the sun. But there were some inaccuracies in the new model that were becoming apparent now that we had invented things like accurate clocks and telescopes and methods for measuring precise astronomical positions. It became clear that something was still very off in our understanding about how the Earth and the other planets moved. And that brings us to two very interesting characters, Tycho Brahe and Johann Kepler. Tycho Brahe was born to a wealthy noble family in Denmark. As a child, he was so amazed when he saw an eclipse of the sun take place exactly when it had been predicted that he decided to become an astronomer. He studied math and astronomy in Germany, but when he did so, he was disappointed to discover that few of the predictions in astronomy were as beautifully accurate as he had hoped. He was discovering the inaccuracies of the heliocentric model. So he got a grant from the King of Denmark to build an observatory and spent his days recording the position of absolutely everything in the sky as perfectly as possible, as was his dream. Meanwhile, the son of a poor German family, Johann Kepler, he had a dream too. He had had a hard life. His father died when he was young. His mother, an accused witch, was abusive toward young Kepler. She forced him to resign from school as a young boy to make money for the family as a waiter. But Kepler persisted in studying theology, science, and math. And man, did he love math. He had this theory that there was an underlying geometric structure to astronomy, much like the Greeks. He knew there had to be reasons why the planets moved at certain speeds and why they were specific distances from the sun. And he wanted to understand the whole beautiful pattern. The trouble was, his theory sounded too much like ancient Greek mysticism as opposed to hard modern science, so he couldn't get any support for his work. In fact, he had to become an astrologer just to make ends meet. And while Kepler was a fantastic mathematician, he needed good data to work his math on, and he had no means to obtain the data needed data like very accurate records of the position of all the planets over several years. You can probably see where this is going. By all accounts, Tycho Brahe was an obnoxious, conceited jerk. And he was temperamental and guarded. At university, he was famous for getting into fights and had even lost his nose in a duel. He had it replaced with a gold one. And then got several more so he could wear different noses for different occasions. Eventually, his temperament lost him the support of the King of Denmark, but gained a position as the royal mathematician of the Holy Roman Empire. When Kepler got a job as Tycho Brahe's assistant, the two fought almost constantly. And the thing they fought about most? Kepler wanted Brahe's notes. So you can imagine how it might look when Tycho Brahe suddenly died of adult-onset mysterious circumstances and shortly thereafter, Johann Kepler got his job, took his notes, and developed his famous Three Laws of Planetary Harmonics. A little suspicious. Now, the popular story was that Tycho Brahe had been at dinner with a local baron and refused to leave the table before the baron, which was considered rude, even when he had to use the little astronomer's room. They sat so long drinking wine that Tycho Brahe gave himself a kidney infection and died. But a later exhumation of his body revealed he had died as a result of mercury poisoning. The problem is, Brahe had no shortage of enemies. Part of his falling out with the King of Denmark, for example, involved Brahe sleeping with the King's wife, and he was, understandably, a bit vengeful. Then too, Tycho Brahe was a chemist and often worked with mercury. He might have poisoned himself by accident. Or he might have been self-medicating with mercury because he did have an ongoing kidney problem. 
However it happened, Kepler ended up with Brahe's notes, and he discovered that indeed there was a mathematical system that underlay all planetary motion. In the end, he developed three laws, his so-called three laws of planetary harmonics. First, he discovered that the planets orbited not in perfect circles, but in ellipses, which are a bit like squashed circles or ovals. Sometimes they are slightly closer to the sun, sometimes farther away. Second, he discovered that the planets cover equal areas of their orbit in equal periods of time, which means the planets move faster the closer they are to the sun. And third, he discovered that there's a constant mathematical relationship between the distance of a planet from the sun and the period of its orbit. Basically, the only thing that determines how long a planet takes to get around the sun is how far away from the sun it is. Now, Spelljammer glossed over some of this stuff. And Spelljammer orbits were perfect circles. But the speeds of the planets were based entirely on their distance from their respective solar bodies. Which is what allowed for the really neat giant poster map that you could generate your planetary systems on. So once again, we have to give props to Jeff Grubb for his scientific prowess. Besides, the story of Kepler and Brahe is too good a story not to tell. And honestly, what did you expect from an episode about the GIF? A 20-minute biology lesson about hippos? This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.